<laughs> well, thank you very much, Urban Shields, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, I do have a PowerPoint here, as you can see, and I'll, I, I don't, I'm not going to read from any notes or anything like that, but uh, I'll be guided by the uh, uh, PowerPoint that, I'll, that I see behind me very nicely. Um, how did I get into this story? Um, when I was in graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania, I read this book on diplomatic memories. Uh, it's almost 100 years old, written in 1930 um, by William Franklin Sands. And he's a good writer, and it's an interesting book. Um, and probably as a result, uh, because he wrote a book, which is kind of his memoirs of his time in Korea, nobody's really done any research on him. Uh, there are a couple people who have looked at it, spent a few days looking through his papers. Uh, I found out about his papers uh, because they were located in an archive uh, not far from where I grew up in Philadelphia. And it turned out I had gone to graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania, which is in Philadelphia. So occasionally when I came back for Christmas or Easter, came back home to visit the folks, I'd drive out to the archive. It was in a Catholic, uh, Sands was Catholic, uh, went to Georgetown University. Uh, so uh, one of his sons donated his papers to this uh, uh, our, uh, this Catholic seminary archive. And so I'd go out there for a day or two and look through it. Oh, this is pretty interesting, but I had other, other things going on. And it wasn't until not long ago that I finished with the other projects. And I said, I'm going to get a sabbatical, a one-year sabbatical, and I'm going to spend a year going through these papers, as well as uh, ancillary things like the, the Allen papers uh, and things like that. And what I found was that the things that were in his book in 1930 uh, sometimes didn't jive with what was in his papers. Uh, some of the things he, he just omitted, uh, and I think we'll come to that. Uh, he, uh, or there are discrepancies. He says one thing in the book, but it says another thing in the papers. So uh, this intrigued me, of course, because I was a historian. So my goal was, well, let's, let's do a book, not just an article or uh, a lecture or something. Oh, let's do a book about Sands and essentially, this is the product of that, just came out last year. And it's, it doesn't replicate with one or two like lines here or there, it doesn't replicate uh, anything that's in here. So it's, it's not like you don't have to read this because you can read this. They're completely different books. So, What's uh, now? Do I how do I change the so uh, how would slide I, of it? Do I have a place to change the slides? Do not come out of the And while I'm doing that, let me let me say hello to all the millions of you who are out there on Zoom that are. You're too far away from the computer. All right, it should work. Oh, was it? Oh. Most of us are techno dwarfs. Oh, I have a flat tire on the information. Yeah. Is this the slide you want to be on? Uh, I believe that's the first one, yes. That's cool. That's over here. Okay. The, the left hand okay. key. Okay. So it's just the mouse. Okay. 
Yes. Okay. Thank you for the technological support. Um, what you see here is uh, William Franklin Sands' dad, who was a rear admiral in the US Navy. Uh, he had also gone to Georgetown University. So his son went to Georgetown University. And uh, we have a couple like this here. Oh, uh, one or two. Oh, where do I go back? Three rows to die. Oh, dear. Okay, I have. Uh, we might need Jack to. Why don't you just tell me? Yeah. Okay. Just hit right. the arrow and okay. yeah, that that'll be easy. That'll be good, Jack. Thanks. Uh, I have three photos of Admiral Sands, uh, and if we do the next one, uh, the last one here, you see him in his uh, his uniform, and uh, the next slide will show uh, Sands's mother. Uh, Mary Elizabeth Mead. Uh, for those of you interested in, in American history, she's related to General Mead of the uh, Civil War. So this is a very prominent, very, very prominent family. Very prominent family. We'll do the next one. And uh, not only are they prominent, but uh, as you can see, uh, father wrote to his son. Uh, we are not without influential friends, which basically meant they were friends with presidents and secretaries of state and senators and uh, pretty much anybody who was anybody at the turn of the century. Uh, let's go to the next one. Sands graduated from Georgetown in 1896 and uh, his dad wanted him to take his mother to Germany for the summer, but he said he wanted to join the diplomatic corps. And uh, so his dad got him uh, appointments with the president and the secretary of state, et cetera, et cetera. And he chose, he had a choice between Japan or uh, Chile, and he chose Japan. And so for the first year of his diplomatic career, he was in Tokyo. And you can read his, uh, the back of that photograph. And of course, this is the picture I used on the front of the book. There is the second secretary at the legation, 1897. And now we'll change to the next one. Uh, his boss there was uh, Edwin Dunn, US Minister to Japan. Uh, he, in turn, was replaced by uh, Alfred Book, the next minister to Japan. But there was a change in administration, the McKinley uh, administration was coming in. And what that meant was that there was a wholesale uh, reshuffling of the overseas diplomatic corps. Here he is. And so Sands essentially lost his job in Japan. Uh, he came back into the United States, and but he still wanted to be in the diplomatic corps, so he had his dad once again uh, schmooze, as we shall say, uh, the various people in the new administration. And if we go to the next phrase here, he met with the Secretary of State uh, John Hay, uh, the Assistant Secretary of State uh, William W. W. as he's known. Rockhill, who, by the way, uh, became one of Sands's supporters later on. And going to the next slide, uh, the Assistant Secretary of State, Albi Adi. If we go to the next slide, uh, what happened when Sands went back to the Department of State, courtesy of his dad, uh, he was promised uh, to get the next open position. And the next open position was secretary of the US legation in Korea under, and you all know who Horace Allen is, who was the minister to Korea. If we go to the next slide, uh, we've got some photographs of uh, the Russian legation at the top of the hill, um, the British legation uh, next to the American embassy, uh, the American embassy here, 
And if we go to the next one after that, you will see that this is where Sands lived on the legation grounds. It's still there. And you can see Horace Allen standing the lower left there. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see the floor plan for the uh, where the secretary, that is Sands, lived. And the next slide will show the interior. So it's quite well appointed. And uh, this was the this was the house that Alan used to live until he got promoted to being the minister. And so he was sorry to leave this house. He liked that better than the one he moved to. So let's go to the next slide. And uh, for two years, Sands and Alan worked together. Sands, of course, was a subordinate, and Alan was the, uh, his superior. Uh, but at one time in 1899, uh, Alan went home to Toledo, Ohio on home leave, and that meant leaving Sands in charge. And Sands apparently wasn't a very good bookkeeper. And so, uh, Sam's poor bookkeeping skills caused Alan upon his return to say that things were in a pretty bad snarl, forcing Alan to use his own money to balance the books. When questioned by the State Department auditor, Sands wrote a very sharp letter back. And it's not clear if Sands ever paid back Alan because Alan had to make up the shortfall using his own money. So there was a little bit of a kerfuffle between Alan and Sands. It wasn't uh, an end of the thing. It was just a minor little kerfuffle. Let's go to the next. While Sands was working at the US Embassy here in Seoul, there were two deaths about seven weeks apart. The first was Clarence Greathouse, who was legal fire advisor to the Foreign Office. And the next person who passed away was General Charles Legendre. These are both Americans, uh, who was the advisor to the Imperial Household uh, Department, the Gu Meibu. And Kojong wanted an American to replace, especially this uh, Legendre, and so uh, he made an offer to Sands. Sands went to Alan. Alan said, yeah, I think it would be a good idea to take this position. And so at the end of 1899, Sands resigned his position from the US diplomatic service and went to work for the Korean government and specifically uh, under Emperor Kojong. If we go to the next, slide, you see that the king is absolutely untrustworthy, weak, foolish, utterly without conscience, and surrounded by ministers of equally lax ideas of honesty and morality. This is what Sands said. And Sands was in the palace every day, according to his papers. 30 years later, Sands would write, I was sorry for the helpless emperor. So he's He's going to change his, his mind 30 years later in a little bit. Let's go to the next slide. Here is what he says. I'm the only foreigner who has free access to the palace. And as I go there every day, I see a great deal. Uh, some of his paper, all this is handwritten, you know, so some of some of these I can't figure out what it actually who he wrote this. <clears throat> Let's go to the next slide. Uh, he was not only appointed to the uh, Imperial Household Department, but he was also appointed to the Foreign Office. And so here is the, uh, the decree by the Emperor. Uh, so it says the Gumebu, Shanijan, Ligodin, Sando. Sando was his Korean name uh, to become the Komungong uh, at the uh, foreign office. So he's wearing two hats, wearing two hats. Uh, let's turn the page. Uh, when he gave up his position at the American legation, he was replaced by Edwin G. Morgan, 
Some of you may know him as the person who replaced Horace Allen as the last minister to Korea before the Japanese took over. Uh, so Edwin B. Morgan comes in and then the next one, uh, oh yes, the next phrase is someone near and dear to the Royal Asiatic Society, Homer Holbert. Uh, Homer Holbert uh, built a very nice house here in Seoul. But then he sold that house to the Korean government. I think the next slide will show that, I hope. There it is. The Taewon Jung, Brilliant of Good View. I've got a copy of it in Japanese uh, down there. Um, we have a couple slides of that. I think there's one more. If he steps out on his lanai out on the front porch, he's got a good view of Seoul on his, on his porch. We have one more. Here's another view. And if you look carefully, you see on the lower left-hand corner, you see a series of steps leading up to the front porch. And if we go to the next one, the house is gone, but the steps that you can see on the right-hand side there is still there. This picture was taken about three years ago, and it's right behind the Plaza Hotel. Hmm. I went there the day before yesterday. What was a parking lot is now a giant office building, and even the steps aren't there. So there's not anything, nothing left. Um, we can go to the next one. Uh, Sands uh, light horses. Uh, here he is on his horse. Uh, I believe that that's the uh, Yongdong Cathedral. Uh, tower in the back. Next uh, slide will show him with his dog. He had Chinese servants, as you can see. Uh, there's another one with his dog there. And the best thing I like is the next one. Oh, not this one. <laughs> uh, next one after that, uh, we, go, we go to, well, right, let's go back to the one with the ship. We have a picture of him on a Japanese ship, okay? Uh, but the one after that, I think, yes, this is a count book for April 1901. And if you've got great eyesight and you look very closely, you'll see the first item underneath, honey for bear. He had a pet bear, 60 sen, honey for bear. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the bear. I wish I did. Uh, but it's interesting to see his daily expenses. This is for April 1901. And of course, he's living in this wonderful house that Homer Holbrook had built and then sold to the Korean government. So we can go ahead. Uh, Sands had friends in Korea. Uh, the person who replaced Edwin V. Morgan as secretary uh, to the legation is Gordon Paddock. He was friends with the uh, French minister to Korea. He met the French a lot because they went to the same church. They were Catholic, so they went to the Yongdong Cathedral every Sunday. W.W. Uh, Rockhill, you've already seen. Uh, you probably know these two businessmen, uh, Colbrand and Ballstrick, who did the uh, streetcar on Chong No and the waterworks and the electric light, that sort of thing. Min Young Hwan, of course, uh, a general for the Korean army, and Yi Che Young, the governor of Seoul. Uh, some of these are going to be part of what's going to be called the American Party. So let's go to the next one. Uh, here we have. Uh, Edwin B. Morgan seated front and center, Paddock on the left, Willard Strait on the right. This is at the American Embassy. Uh, Gordon Paddock and a visitor from the United States. It's in the dark, and here's the president's daughter with Paddock and Nick Longworth at the U.S. legation. So Paddock 
and Sands were good friends. Good friends. Uh, let's turn to the next one. Uh, as it's going to turn out, Alan and Sands are not going to get along. I already told you about the bookkeeping kerfluffle, but there's going to be more. And uh, here's what Alan says. Paddock is a good-hearted man, not at all like Sands. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, there's Myungdong Cathedral. Uh, some of these pictures are taken by Sands. Not all of them, though, are some are just photographs that were floating around at the time and Sands put in his paper. So here's the uh, cathedral. I think there's one more here. Uh, on this side of the cathedral is the or is the Japanese section of Seoul. Yeah, Japanese radiation. And here's his good friend from the, the French side of things, uh, uh, Duplantis. I think the next slide will show them smoking the, the Yangban pipe together. Uh, here are some, uh, some of the American businessmen that Sands and Allen uh, supported. Um, I've been trying to get to figure out who exactly they were. I think that Townsend is the guy front and center. Uh, we are not sure which one is Bostwick and which one uh, is the other. They both look the same though with the mustache. So I can't tell uh, who they are. I asked, I asked Suk Ji Hoon, but he, he didn't know either. So if he doesn't know, nobody knows. <laughs> but frankly, uh, so let's, let's go on. Uh, well, here's Cole Brand, obviously a little bit older. And uh, here's Bostwick also a little bit older. So these are the two main businessmen that Sands uh, supported. They were friends. And when uh, Sands wasn't able to move into that nice house right away, he stayed with Colbran and Bostwick. Uh, they're the ones running the, the trolley. I think the next one will show the trolley. Uh, this is, I believe, Dongbei one. Now uh, you see the car that the Colbran and Bostwick uh, had built. If we go to the next slide, uh, here's what Alan is. Alan's starting to get a little snarky, you'll see. Uh, Sam seems to have hypnotized some people by his manners, notably Cole Brandon Boswick. This, of course, is private. He's writing to Hunt. Some of you may know Lee Hunt. I think the next great slide will show him. There he is. And you know him as the guy in charge of the Unsan Mines, which will be the next slide, I believe. Uh, there it is. And uh, Min Young Hwan, it's going to turn out to be another friend of Sands. And together, they're going to try to some, set up something called the, the Seoul Mining Corporation. Uh, but it turned out when they hired someone to look at the gold in the in the share, found out that it was no good. But Min was part of it, and uh, Lee, Hunt was, Lee Hunt was part of it, and some of the other people who were the American party. Let's go to the next slide. Here's one of the American party, perhaps the leader of the American party, Yi Che Yun, the mayor of Seoul. And uh, you may know what happened to him. He was poisoned uh, by the enemy of the Americans, and that would be E. Yong Nick. Uh, you can't prove it 100%, but they went, he and some other people went to a banquet hosted by E. Yong Nick, and they all ended up dead. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, here are some enemies of Sands. Uh, e. Yong Nick, I've already mentioned. Uh, or a sound you'll hear about, Russians you'll hear about, Japanese you'll hear about. Uh, John McLevy Brown, it's an interesting story. When Sands first came to Korea, he thought John McLevy Brown was great because he uh, was frugal. He 
he got this, a surplus to the Korean treasury where it had been a deficit. So Sand said, oh, this guy is great. Hip, 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 hooray, he said for Brown. But when Sands became a member of the Korean government, his attitude toward cha change toward McLevy Brown. Uh, just to give you one example, the Korean legation in Washington, D.C. needed, had expenses. Brown wouldn't send the expenses. And so uh, if we go to the next slide, you'll see hip hip away for Brown, the most capable man when the British prevented the Russians from replacing him. Well, the, the Russians tried to replace him with Alexeyev didn't work. And now if we go to the next phrase, to the unformable disobedience of Brown of the Financial Commission who refused to attend the meetings, nothing has been done. Should he again refuse to act, I do not see how he can avoid dismissal. This is what Sands wrote to Kojong. Brown is a constant sort of trouble. Accordingly, Korean legation should receive their money from Brown, and he knows it and does not prevent the pretend the contrary, and yet the legation has received not one penny for over a year. And then Sands writes, I hate him and everybody knows it. 30 years later in his book, Sands says that Brown was honest, responsible for solid and permanent achievement with his international staff, the Korean customs. So 30 years change in attitude between 1901 and 1930. Let's go to the next phrase. Here's the guy that, uh, and this is, Alan and Sands were in agreement on two things. One, that we should promote American business. We call that dollar diplomacy, right? Uh, trade, uh, political interest will spill over from economic interest, okay? But the other thing they had in common was that E. Yong Ik hated both of them because they were Americans. So E. Yong Ik would do anything he could to uh, disrupt any American plans. And as it's going to turn out, E. Yong Ik is going to hold up Sands's uh, severance pay until Sands is already out of the country. So the next uh, video we have, we have uh, another enemy of Sands, and that would be the guy standing to the, in your picture to the right of Horace Allen, and that would be Hayashi Gonske. That's Allen in the top hat, of course, and it's Hayashi Gonske uh, to the right in the picture. And uh, if we go to the next one, we have the Japanese and the Russians they're both trying to take over Korea, make a long story short. And the best way to do it is to get rid of people like Sands, who is trying to get Korea to be a neutral country. Neither the Japanese nor the Russians want Korea to be neutral. And so the Japanese and the Russians, they, they use the same tactics. Anytime Sands goes out of town, like for instance, he had some, something going on up north against uh, Jiang Zu Lin or something like that. The Japanese uh, went in to Kojong and said, you should replace Sands with this guy Kato. Sands comes back, says, what's going on here? He go into Kojong and say, what's going on here? And so they, uh, Kato was sent to some other ministry. Uh, the next person attempt by the Russians was by the Russians, and it was to bring in a Danish guy, uh, Julian Stepp. And once again, this happened when uh, another time when Sands was out of the country. As soon as Sands is out of the picture, the Russians or the Japanese go in to Kojong and say, you should replace Sands in the uh, household department. And the final one 
uh, is also Russian, and that one is going to be successful. They're going to get Sands dismissed from the uh, the first one, the first Russian one. Sands was dismissed from the Foreign Office. The second one, he's going to be dismissed from the household. Well, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Let's go to the next one. Despite the antagonism of Yi Yong Ik and the Russians and the Japanese, his main antagonist turned out to be his former boss, Alan. Uh, here's what Sands had to say about that. My first duty is to the Korean government. This position has given offense to my former chief, Alan, who considers me still as his subordinate and a most ungrateful one in as much as I do not tell him things which I have no right to tell anyone. And then here's what Alan said. Sands is inclined to act in an entirely independent manner, meaning he doesn't follow my lead. And then Alan said, Sands continues to be more kind of a fool. He's the laughing stock of the whole town. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, Sands had a girlfriend. He's a single guy. He's young. He's in his mid 20s. So he's got a Japanese girlfriend. So Alan is going to refer to her as Miss Butterfly in the Puccini opera. Right? Let's go to the next. So uh, what, what led to more friction between Alan and Sands? Sands dismissed friends of Alan from the government. Uh, Alan supported McLevy Brown when Sands hated McLevy Brown. Sands tried to supplant Allen as the leader of the American party. This is an interesting one. The household department uh, hosted a banquet at the, at the, at the palace. Uh, and because of that, Sands was at the head table. And Allen was down in the hoi polloi. And Alan refused to go there because he didn't want to be seen as subordinate to Sands. Uh, Sands did not inform Alan about a proposed minor, mining concession with Colbrand and Bostwick. I mentioned that to you already. Min Young Hwan was involved in that as well. Uh, Sands had a guy to go to Washington to lead the legation. Sands had been grooming him. Alan opposed him. So as Alan said, they send some idiot to Washington, D.C. Let's go to the next one. Uh, Sands uh, for a while was in charge in getting rid of the cholera epidemic. They heard some of the cholera workers, Pyongyang Cholera Corps. And uh, the next one down, the next phrase, Sands is in high feather. He is a sort of self-constituted board of health. And as such, he has really interfered with better plans for working against cholera. Some other, let's go to the next slide. Uh, something else that uh, got in the way of Alan and Sands was, Sands owed money to everybody. Uh, he owed money to the German lady who ran the only Western hotel for a while. Uh, he liked to play poker and lost a lot. His son said he was a good poker player, but apparently he lost a lot. Uh, the French teacher at the hotel, Miss Butterfly, who, according to rumor, was being paid by saying 700 yen a month, but he was only making 300 yen a month. So how could he pay? Anyhow, we'll add it up to $15,000 or 30,000 yen. Uh, his dad sent him $2,000, the Admiral, but that wasn't enough to cover all of his debts. And so what people did was they came knocking on the door of the American embassy, legation say, uh, this guy owes me money. Can you make him pay? And Alan couldn't make 
Sands Bay. Alan didn't work for Sands anymore. Uh, so there's complaints about that. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so here's where Sands is going to uh, get fired. Uh, when the Russians the second time tried to replace Sands, Sands had gone off to Beijing for some sort of reason for on behalf of the government. When he came back, he found out that a Belgian guy had replaced him as the advisor to the Imperial Household Department. You got to understand that uh, the way it works is the English and the Japanese were on one side, the Russians, the French, and the Belgians are on the other side. Okay, so when you see Belgian, it's really a stalking horse for the Russians. Okay. Uh, and according to the contract that Sands has, the Taiwan Zhang, the uh, Pavilion of Good Review, Good View, uh, is for VIPs that they should come to the country, and he would have to vacate for a couple days until. Uh, the VIP leaves and then he can go back to his house. Uh, but when he came back from China and found out that he had been supplanted at the household department by this Belgian, and there was a Japanese prince coming in to celebrate the anniversary of the coronation of Kojong, he refused to leave. And so the Korean government said, to Alan, Alan, can you can you get him to leave? And so Alan wrote Sands a note saying, "Look, uh, you've left before. Uh, can you vacate the house so this Japanese prince can stay here for a couple of days for the coronation uh, ceremony?" And Sands said, "No. Uh, well, why not? Well, because uh, they just." When I was gone, they hired this Belgian guy to replace me. And now the Korean government is listing you, Horace Allen, to kick me out of my own house. So now Sands scarcely speaks to me now over the house matter. Uh, eventually, Sands leaves and checks into a hotel. But in the process, he turns in all of his medals and uh, honorary or whatever to the government. He's so upset with the Korean government that he's going to uh, turn in all of his medals, all of his things like that. Alan says, Sands, for whom I have done so much and suffered so much, is compelling me to keep a sharp lookout for my life. He's afraid that Sands is going to knock him off. Sands returned all of his decorations to the government. He demanded $24,000. He got, where, where did 24,000 come from? The Belgian guy was offered 12,000 a year and there was still two years left on Sands's five-year contract. So 12,000 times two, 24,000. Alan said, look, if you're quitting and you're gonna go back, and you're going to ask for $24,000. There's no way the Korean government is going to give you $24,000. No way. So it got whittled down to $3,700. But Lee Yong Ik refused to release the money. And uh, sorry, another, uh, let's go to the next phrase. Uh, sorry. Here's Sands leaving. Uh, he had been fired by the basically fired by the Korean government. Paddock, who had a kind of a legal mind, said, well, if you turn in all your decorations and medals, then the household department would have good cause to dismiss you, to terminate you. Uh, so here is Sands on the left, leaving with the Russians right after the beginning of the uh, Russo-Japanese War of 1905. Uh, as you know, Ito Hirobumi comes in. Uh, the next slide is going to show him sitting 
in Sands's old house in the front front porch, and that's Pluto front and center with the with the top hat there. Number six. Uh, Sands comes back to the United States. He is going to marry this beautiful young lady in uh, 1909 in Philadelphia. Um, he's still got some diplomatic interests going on. He's going to be in London. He's going to be in Moscow. Uh, he's going to be sent to Mexico as first secretary. And he'll end up being, uh, when he marries her in 1909, ambassador to Guatemala. So he does have more diplomatic things going on. My book doesn't talk about that, except to just to mention it. If we go to the next slide, uh, we will see that in 1912, he's going to be part of the first diplomatic class. This is when the State Department started training people to be diplomats. And you can see Sands in the second uh, row on the extreme right. And if we go here, Sands in the 1920s. If we go to the 1930s, this is what he's going to look like. And in the, 19, in the late 1920s and all through the 1930s, he's going to take a job as a professor of American history and diplomacy at his alma mater, Georgetown University. And he's, this is the 1930, and the next slide will show it. This is when his book comes out. 1930 is when uh, his book on diplomatic memories uh, comes out. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, here's where there's a difference between what he says in this book and what he said in his papers that I look at in here. Another example of the fact that our haphazard methods of appointment were often luckier than they deserved to be. No one could mistake him, Alan, for anything but a man of strong character, softened by a tender heart and wise in the ways of Koreans. Moreover, Alan was distinctly an American. There was not a diplomat of them all who possessed the confidence of emperor and people as Alan did. <clears throat> Others might cajole or bully. It was to Alan that the emperor turned for advice or consolation. So you see what the difference is between what Alan was afraid Sands was going to kill him back in 1903. And here it is 30 years later, praising Alan to the skies. Okay. Now let's go to the next one. Uh, when these when World War II breaks out, and we, some people say 31 was when it broke out with the Manchurian incident. The, uh, Sands offered his ser services to uh, the military, to the State Department, uh, and what have you. Nobody was interested in him. And why is that? Well, when the when the real war broke out in 1937, when uh, the Manchurian incident uh, uh, occurred, he had four things going against him. One was that he was 67 years old by then. So there was ageism involved. Nobody in the State Department knew who he was because he hadn't been and he had been in academia for the last 20 some years at Georgetown University. He had written a book called Why Blame Japan? And can you imagine what kind of a reception that had in the United States? Basically, what he's saying is Japan's just following in the footsteps of the United States. 
Well, of course, this was not politically correct, should we say, in 1937, 1938. The other thing was, the fourth thing that people held against him was, when he came back from Korea, he said that the Russians had defeated the Japanese in that first uh, shelling in Incheon Harbor, but everybody else believed Jack London's account that it was the Japanese that had scuttled the Russian thing. So it's like some people thought he was a fool, some thought he was a, an apologist for the Japanese, ageism, uh, and nobody knew who he was. Uh, so basically, from 1937 to 1945, he was trying to get a job either with the Army, uh, with the Navy, with the State Department, and the doors pretty much all closed. Toward the end of his life, which was 1945, the, the war ended, of course, Japan was defeated. And he finally got hired by the State Department to be to head up something called the Korean Educational Mission or something like that. And basically what he did was he uh, his job was to go to San Francisco and meet the first delegation of Koreans from South Korea to come to the United States and take them to the State Department and show them around and that sort of thing. And uh, he stole the show because he recounted everything about his life and experiences in, uh, in Korea. 40 years earlier. At any rate, he died the next, later that year in 1946. He's buried in the uh, cemetery in Washington, D.C. His wife died uh, four years later. He, uh, he had four kids. Uh, one of the kids I interviewed before he passed away uh, because he had a house right outside of Philadelphia. And so uh, one of the things that's in the book that I didn't tell you about was that uh, Sands also went in 1901 to Jeju to put down the Jeju Rebellion, which was uh, in part caused by Catholic uh, tax collectors uh, uh, collecting an unreasonable tax uh, foisted on them by E. Yong Nick. And so uh, Sands was sent there and the um, his son at his house showed me a brick with a bullet hole indentation that his dad had given him say, uh, this almost killed me. It kept, hit me right next, next to my head when I was in Jeju. Uh, the end of that story is um, the French uh, inducted him into the Legion of Honor for saving the French priests uh, who were converting these people who were then becoming tax collectors for a corrupt uh, Korean government. And uh, by the way, there was also a kerfuffle that Sands has since this is the RES had a kerfuffle with uh, Homer Hulbert because Homer Hulbert, uh, being of course a Protestant, was saying, oh, these Catholics, they're no good and doing all these bad things. Uh, Sand said, well, yeah, it's true that these Catholic tax collectors are doing bad things, but it's Eong Ik that's behind it because he's the one that instructed these Catholics to collect the taxes and in return, we won't charge them the tax. So of course they're gonna do it, right? And then uh, he's also gonna say the Japanese were helping the rebels too because the rebels had Japanese rifles and where'd they get these Japanese rifles but from the Japanese uh, as well. Let's go to the next, uh, well, uh, the end of the story, I guess. 
the, uh, as Reverend Shields has already mentioned, this reprint by the RAS of Undiplomatic Memories, 1975. And this one came out in 1987. It's the same book, but a different, slightly different title, uh, 1987. I think this might be the last slide. Well, he wrote about his time in uh, Guatemala. Let's do one more and see what's going on. Oh, let's just do where Sam's used to work. But that's the, anyhow, uh, let me bring this little story to an end. I hope you have questions. Uh, and uh, I know I skipped over a lot of things, mostly the stuff about Jeju, for example, or the memorials he wrote to Kojong saying, you got to do this, you got to do that. Was he a cultural imperialist? Hmm. You can be the judge uh, of that. But let me stop here and take your questions. Oh, so, thank you very much. much. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate that. Great storytelling. It's a great story. I feel like I've just been listening to the story of Mr. Sunshine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if there was any uh, connection. So uh, any questions? And Jack, if you would please help us with anybody that yeah. might be online with a question. And I'll, I'll just let you field well, the sure. questions. I don't need to point to people myself. And, yes. and, and if somebody online wants to do a question, Jack will uh, okay. help I, with that. Go on here. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Two questions. One is, can you kind of provide background on Yonik, who he was? I heard the name before, but I didn't need to grasp exactly what historical figure he was. And the second, the time period that uh, Mr. Sands uh, was in Korea or the time period that Sojak Phil, uh, or Phil Jason, was also in Korea. And then also in the time that the East Man was uh, in jail and released and came to the uh, United States mm -hmm. around 1904, 1905. I was wondering if you found any paperwork that ties them to, to him uh, with their deal of work. Mm. Um, thank thank you. you for your question. Um, Eongik um, was uh, a coolie, a miner, um, but he rose to prominence when uh, there was a, uh, I think it was the Chinese that were. Uh, coming in and he carried the queen to safety on his back, uh, snuck her out of the palace. And uh, for doing that, uh, of course, Kojong was uh, very grateful. Uh, this was uh, young, you know, Mindy uh, took her out and uh, saved her. So he saved her life. And so he rose up quite, quite uh, much. Um, Sojay Peel, uh, Sojay Peel and uh, Isingma. and Isingma. Well, Isingma was in jail, you know, for about four years. Uh, that was when he wrote that "The Spirit of Independence." Um, uh, Sojay Peel, uh, at the time, he he was involved uh, with the. Uh, Independence Club, uh, he left, and uh, he was an American citizen by this time because he had married an American woman and he had an MD. So he uh, he was uh, at the time a, a doctor at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital where where I went to school, and it turned out that uh, he. Uh, where I was living in Philadelphia, his house was right down the street. So it's now the Sade Peel Kinyong Guan, uh, which uh, you can go and see today. Uh, so there's nothing in the Sands uh, papers about that. There is one thing you've left out one guy, though, that Sands does comment on, and that's uh, Yun Chi Ho. And uh, Sands uh, thought that you didn't like Yun Chi Ho. And uh, it, it was uh, NGO kind of weighed in, um, calling Sands kind of a high-handed high guy. I don't, I can't, I didn't put it in here. 
but also that uh, Wu Jiho being a Protestant was kind of going against the, the Catholic tax collectors in Jeju. So uh, Sands equated Wu Jiho's anti-Catholicism, if you will, with Holbrook's anti-Catholicism, blaming everything on the tax collectors who were Catholic in Jeju, not mentioning so much the Japanese or the corrupt Korean government. So, but no, nothing, nothing about Isomon, uh, nothing about um, Soviet. Thank you for your question. The book says it all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I want to know after course, uh, why Sand uh, is thinking about uh, Alan is so different between 30 years of time differences. That's a good that's why, a, why yeah. he changed his mind about him. Oh, uh, he changed his mind about uh, a number of things. He, uh, he he became much more sympathetic to Kojong. Uh, he became much obviously much more sympathetic to McLevy Brown, uh, praising him, and he uh, praised Alan. I am I'm not sure why he changed. You know, maybe the passage of time uh, made him more mellow. Uh, I don't know. Um, I, you know, Alan died in 1932 or 33, and I wasn't able to figure out if uh, Alan had read Undiplomatic Memories. It came out in 1930, and Alan died like, I think, three years later. I'd be curious to see what. If, if Alan read it and, and, and what he thought. Um, there's, a, there's a book by uh, Fred Harvey Harrington, uh, written in 1945, 44, sorry. Um, and it's all about Boris Allen. And if you, if you, and I've gone through the Allen papers, of course, but if, if you go through the uh, book uh, it's called God, Mammon, and the Japanese by uh, this guy. Um, he doesn't say anything about Sands. There's nothing in there about the fight between Sands and Allen. He's, I'm talking about the Harrington book. Um, uh, so I was kind of disappointed in that. But if you look at the Allen papers, there's a lot of conflict between Sands and Allen. So uh, I don't know why Sands mellowed about Alan, uh, but he did. And of course, three years later, he dies. And I don't know if he ever read the book or not. I'd be <laughs> curious. <laughs> I'd be Men curious. Old, old men. Yeah, I old men. Two old, <laughs> two old men, I guess. Yeah. Oh, but. To, to be fair, um, at the time that Sands was in Korea, he, he was fresh out of college. Whereas Sand, uh, Alan was 43 years old, married, couple kids. Um, so there's a, there's a generation. And, you know, it's, it's clear that, you know, Alan, being the senior person, probably thought that Sands should kind of defer to him more than, than Sands did. And uh, as, as Sands said, look, uh, I don't work for the, you and the Americans anymore. I, I work for the Korean government. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't put America first. I have to put, I have to put Korea first. Mm -hmm. And 
I don't think Alan appreciated that very much. As I said, they did agree on certain things, most that they wanted to encourage American commerce and concessions, I guess you would call it in Korea. And Cole Brand and Wallstwick are the uh, main people. The, the train that goes out to Incheon was an American train, at least initially. Uh, light, the, the light fixtures, the trolley, uh, the mines, these were all American concessions and they were trying to get more. The, uh, what Alan was trying to do is saying, you know, if Alan knew that the Washington, the, the State Department didn't care about Korea. They didn't care about Korea. If, if Japan wants to take over, as Roosevelt would say, let them. You know, we, we have no interest in Korea. So Alan was saying, you know, if we get more American concessions there, that'll spill over to political interests that will take more of an interest in Korea. Maybe we'll stick up for Korean independence instead of just looking the other way when Japan comes in. Uh, Sands, for his part, he wanted Korea to be neutral. And I didn't mention it in my talk, but in the book, he went to school in Switzerland. And so the idea, well, you know, if Korea could be like Switzerland, if we could get the Russians and the Japanese to agree to leave, to make Korea uh, a neutral country, it would be all the best. And it didn't happen. That's what he wanted. One of the things that he, uh, he was supposed to go to the coronation of Edward II, 1902, something like that. And uh, it turned out that behind the scenes, the British said, no, don't, don't let him go. Mm -hmm. And the reason was, uh, if he goes, he's going to promote the neutrality for Korea. Japan and England had just signed the uh, Anglo-Japanese Alliance, 1902. And so it would be not a good idea to have Sands advocating for neutrality uh, when uh, in going to England. So they said, one of the stories says, oh, he's still recovering from the, uh, well, what did he, he was on a trip up to the northern part of Korea, and he uh, came down with, uh, I forget what disease he came down with, but he was uh, still not recovered from that. That was, that was the, the story, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Two questions online. Yes. 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 From uh, Mark Caprio. And then from oh, Mark, Jeff. yes. So, Hi, Mark, Mark. Uh, you're on mute. Have to come off mute. You're still on mute. Maybe his views softened uh, with age, as maybe you know, and I have known as well. I've come to know as well. Uh, my comment is, uh, my question is more of a comment. Um, if, if you have some insight into this, would be interesting. Your uh, uh, your statement that uh, Sands's uh, remarks during the 1930s towards Japan were taken as pro-Japanese or sympathetic to the Japanese cause. Um, it seems a, a number of diplomats were in the same boat. Uh, Joseph Grew uh, was one. There's another guy, Henry something or other, I'm forgetting his last name, but he also wrote some things that suggested that Japan is doing something that everybody else is doing. Um, Joseph Grew, of course, he gave speeches uh, saying that the emperor should be saved. Uh, you get rid of a few bad people, then you can uh, get back to business as usual, but he became under Secretary of State. So I'm just wondering, uh, what is, is there some connection here about diplomats that worked overseas that came back and, and, and adopted a sympathetic attitude towards the Japanese at this time? And if, if Sands changed his views as the war progressed or what, what was, uh, the maintain them till his, his dying days? But if it's more of a comment than anything else, but if you have any insight, that'd be I'd be interested in hearing. 
Well, thanks, Mark, and thanks, thanks for being online. The, um, you probably know that uh, there were two factions in the US State Department, uh, those like uh, Gru who were, I don't wanna say pro-Japanese, but- you know, Japanese they, hands, yeah. They knew about, and you're probably thinking of Henry Stimson. Uh, no, someone, his last name begins with a D. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm failing to remember his name. But the, but the, the diplomats from the United States who had been stationed in China, you know, they wanted to, uh, you know, they wanted to get rid of the emperor. They want, and so you had these two factions within the uh, State Department. I do not have any evidence that he changed his mind about the uh, the Japanese. Um, I don't I don't think he was pro Japanese. He you know, for, for years, he's, he was teaching American diplomacy and history. <laughs> and so he's looking at the course of American history and he's saying, well, you know, what the Americans did in Panama, what the Americans did in Hawaii, well, that's, that's just what the Japanese are doing. They're just following the same game plan. But, um, and in the book, and I don't have my glasses here, but in the book, uh, I do have a, uh, a letter that Sands got when he he sent the book to Macmillan, the publishing giant, and uh, the letter basically said, uh, "We're not going to publish this." Yeah. Said <laughs> basically, I don't remember the exact words. It's in the book, but said uh, this this isn't going to fly. We're not going to yeah. publish it. Uh, I don't know if he changed his mind or ever his what he was doing at the time was he wanted to he wanted to help the American government and the American government didn't seem to be interested in his expertise and so at the end of his life I think he was a little bit disappointed that they didn't I mean this guy knew more about Korea than just about anybody else yeah and Nobody was, nobody was paying attention to him. No one, uh, they finally gave him some sinecure to uh, accompany a group of Korean uh, big shots to, the, to Washington, D.C. right after the end of the war. But that's about it. So I think he was a little disappointed that his talents weren't yeah. taken seriously. They surely needed him, though. They didn't have many people that knew anything about Korea at that time. And by the way, he, he, was, he, he, he did start another book before he passed away. He wrote the first two chapters. Uh, uh, it was called something like uh, Korea, the Phoenix of Asia. Huh. And uh, it's still in his papers. He got two chapters out and never went anywhere, obviously, because he passed away. So his, what was his what was his line in the book? Have you uh, read your two chapters? I I, I I read them a long time ago. I didn't put it in the uh, but it was never published, obviously. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember uh, what it was to tell you the yeah. truth at the moment. Good question. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Good, Good seeing you. Hear from you. Yeah. Also I'll be helped. in Korea in a few weeks. <laughs> Okay, I'll be gone in a few weeks, unfortunately. Uh, we also have Jonathan Chang. So, Jonathan, if you want to ask a question, just unmute yourself. For sure. Hi, can, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for the talk. I just wanted to ask um, you know, it seems like a theme of, um, you know, a lot of what you presented there was a lot of conflict in the uh, expatriate community in Korea at the time. A lot of uh, infighting, a lot of cattiness. I wonder if um, in the Horace Allen versus uh, Sands sort of fight, if you found yourself taking a side yourself and finding yourself more sympathetic with one side or with the other. I mean, I've read some of Horace Allen's other, you know, about some of his other relationships and they always seem to be sort of very um, full of conflict. And I'm just curious if uh, if you saw it one way or the other. And of course, you you, you you're writing a biography of William Sands, so I wonder if that also sort of naturally inclined you towards his own sort of view of things. So just just sort of asking. 
Uh, thank you for your question, uh, and that's a good one. I think somewhere in there I uh, say, well, the, the, the reader will have to judge for him or herself uh, if one or the other is at fault. Um, the, uh, how would I, it, it's clear that there were problems on both sides if you if you read Harrington's book, it's a you know it's a very positive positive thing about Alan. You, you don't hear much negative, uh, but if you read the Sands papers and it's in the book here, you do get some negative stuff about Alan. So Alan's by no means a perfect guy. Uh, Sands is by no means a perfect guy. None of us are perfect. Um, and your question is interesting because I, I got a message recently from two of the grandsons of uh, Sands. And uh, one of them said, uh, he, he didn't say, he, he didn't like the book. He didn't say why, but he says he didn't like my approach. Um, you know, and uh, so I didn't know exactly what it what it was that he didn't like about the book. I mean, because because his grandfather went into debt uh, and owed people money, uh, because he uh, had a Japanese girl. I, I mean, I have no idea what he didn't like. Uh, he, he was uh, he was in his mid twenties. I mean. Uh, I, so I don't, so Alan's not a perfect, <laughs> Alan's not perfect, uh, Sands is not perfect. I think uh, I leave it up to the reader to decide is one more uh, at fault than the other. I don't think either of them at fault. I think uh, neither of them are perfect. And, uh, but, but don't you get, don't you get a sense of, the inner workings of the Korean government by seeing these conflicts playing out uh, with the Japanese and the Russians and the French, the Belgians, putting their two cents worth in. I mean, doesn't this it's kind of like the hidden history of the last years of the Chosen Dynasty that, you know, Nobody knows about this stuff. Well, we know about it now that they read the book. But, so I, I don't know if that's a, a good answer to your question. I, I don't come down one way on one side or the other, quite frankly.